Hello. Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming on this beautiful spring day. Um, welcome to Founders Day 2015. My name is Polly Tam. I'm the VP of CSA this year. We're very lucky today to have Ms. Pamela Hawley, uh, who graduated from Castellea in 1987, as our alumna keynote speaker. Pamela's com community service began at the age of 12. After a life-changing family vacation in Mexico, she began volunteering at soup kitchens, passing out meals, tutoring in East Palo Alto. She has volunteered in microfinance in remote villages of India, crisis relief work in the 2000 El Salvador earthquake, sustainable farming in Guatemala, to name a few. In addition to service, she adores her family. Her parents have been married for more than 50 years and they're here today with us. <laughs> she loves being a aunt and is her nieces and nephews sports game cheerleader. Pamela co-founded Volunteer Match in 1996, launching it and its corporate social responsibility program in more than 100 cities. In 2003, she founded Universal Giving, an award-winning nonprofit, helping people donate and volunteer with top-performing vetted organizations all around the world. Pamela is a winner of the Jefferson Award, the Nobel Prize in Community Service, and has been invited three times to the White House. She's a philanthropy expert for the new television show, Billions Rising. She has a political degree from Duke University and a master's in international communication from University of Southern California. Pamela is also an actress, improviser, dancer, and singer in, with performances in San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles. She opened for the San Francisco Improv Festival. Pamela is here today to talk about her time at Castellere and how that influenced her career path and other choices that she has made in her life. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies, please. <laughs> please. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Ms. Pamela Hawley. You know, I told my team when I was getting prepared for this presentation, they said, my gosh, you're spending so much time on this, and wow, so much more. And I said, this is so important. And they said, yes, but we do this every week and all this. And they said, no, this is the most important presentation. And they said, above the White House. I said, above the White House. <laughs> and they said, why? And I said, because I grew up here. And they're like, what? And I said, you'll understand in 40 years. OK, so <laughs> here, we, here we get started. I want to thank you so much for having me here today. This truly is a wonderful sense of home. And what I want to speak with you about today is what Castilea taught me to do was not one of the C words, it was actually a B word, which was to believe. And of course, that started with my family. But I want to talk today about how important it is to believe whether you're a parent, whether you're a student here, an administrator, whether you're someone who collects garbage off the circle and keeps it clean, it doesn't matter. We all need to believe and have goals and be the best we can be. And that's what Castilea taught me. So when I look at Castle, it was just surrounded with this sense of belief. I, I grew up in this area where it wasn't even a, a possibility that you could not do what you thought you could do. So what I want to talk about here is story. The story is so important about your children's story, your story. Why are you here? Why is your child at Castilea? That story is just imperative to what is going to shape your life. And the challenge is that so many of us walk by our story. I want to tell you about how there was a story in my life and how it Castilea helped shape it to be who I am today. So your child's story at Castilea could be many, many, many different things. And I want to start a little bit with what Castilea's mission here. We're educating and motivating young women to become confident thinkers and compassionate. I say both, I highlighted both, because you need to have the confidence, but you've got to have the humility and the compassion as well. It's important to have that balance that we're always staying very, very humble, no matter how much we ascend in our lives. So with our five Cs, we know these very, very well, and I love them very much. They have really companioned me throughout my life. 
who could not want to have more courage, especially if you're going to go improv on the stage, or more um, charity, or more courtesy? We can always have more courtesy. And these are not just for our students, they're for us. Because as we get to be busy moms or educators or leaders, these are not just for students. This is what Castile is saying, you need your entire lifetime and up until the point when you're no longer on this earth. So having said that with the Castilea C's, yes, but what did that mean for me? And what Castilea taught me was Pamela's new five C's. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me today because Castilea taught me to innovate, so I've got to go off and make my own little five, C, five C's here. Well, hers, first of all, is commitment. And this is Mrs. Toby here, and here I am. Now, here I am winning the Community Service Award. I just want to tell you that people are like, wow, that's so impressive. They say that now. I don't think, I don't know if Mrs. Toby is here, but I don't think anyone else wanted that award, okay? So <laughs> I, I got it. And everyone's like, what kind of a wife? For what? Sir? What kind of service? What are you talking about? What sir? You know, so now everyone's like, wow. But at the time, I was like, I don't think anyone wants this. Okay, great. Super. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled. This is my, my most exciting award. So, um, and I have this photo up in my office. And my team, yeah, I have it. And they're like, oh, look. And it's just so precious. That moment there, I will never forget that. Calling. You have to have a strong calling. What is it that you're designed to do here on Earth? Challenges. You might not think that's positive, but, but it's what shapes us. And I faced a lot of challenges when I've done in my life that I'm going to go over today. And I knew that with this C at Castilea, Castilea would get me through these challenges. Crazy and kaleidoscope. OK, so I was like, you know, I'm an improviser. I've got a kaleidoscope. We're going to make it a C. OK, we'll talk about that later. Um, and then Camly. OK, I couldn't find a C word for family, all right? <laughs> So we go with Camly, all right? <laughs> all right. So here's the uh, first one. So uh, commitment. Now, when you go into commitment here, when I came on campus, I knew I was special and that everyone else was in the world. I knew I was expected to explore freely and commit. Not just go explore, and commit to different activities. We needed to develop our individual strengths. I knew I was special, so I was not going to give up. And we were expected to work hard. We were expected to work hard. We were expected to work hard. <laughs> and be nice. <laughs> and be nice. So, and, and I say that because it was so important. We were expected to, to, to work very hard here. But you've also got to be super kind. So Casalea taught me to persevere, for sure, in so many different areas of life. And I am so grateful for that. It required drive. It allowed me to have focus. It taught me the expectation of success. And ingrained in me to work smart, it humbled me. And if someone at Castilea thought I could do better, they let me know. That was not always easy. But they thought I could do better, they would let me know. And you want that. We want that for our children. So, and as hard as it was to hear, I got used to getting that feedback, which was critical to me in what I would be doing later in my life. You've got to have that receptivity, that feedback, because everyone here has your best intentions at heart. So I became more committed. You didn't even think about not being able to succeed. You don't even realize with your daughters here, it's not even a question that you won't succeed. And you need that model as you go forward in life. So the next one is calling. So it encouraged me to be whatever I wanted to be and to find a calling. So to do that, you have to be real. And there was a point where it was too stressful for me to get a 4.0. And I want to share this with you all as parents today because I think this is a decision I made that shaped my life very much. So I relaxed a little and I received a 3.81. <laughs> now I got to tell you here, one of my very dear friends, Bonnie Rosenberg, who is right there. Can you raise your hand, please? There we go. So she was a sevy with me um, here, and she's a very dear friend of mine. And she for sure got 4.0s or 4.1s or 4.2s. And she's amazing. And I'm saying that model can absolutely work. But for me, what happened is, why was this important for me? And I share this with you because the value of a 3.1, for me, I was able to do tennis, basketball, and track. I could start a volunteer program, even when it was not popular. Um, I could run for student government, join junior statements, build strong friendships, try acting, which did not work. Acting did not work at the time. That would come 20 years later. And to search for who I wanted to be. And that's what I needed. I needed to be able to go do all these different things. And it was stressing me out too much to get a 4.0. Why do I share that with you, Dave? Because if one of your daughters is stressing out about that, it's OK, because it's all right to explore these things. And that's who I needed to be as a person. And some people can achieve that 4.0, and great. But it's OK to relax a little bit and experience all that Castilea has to give. 
So here I am, I'm cum laude, I started a volunteer club, cooking club, that's me, that's where I'm getting done with the volunteer event with my nephew recently. Tennis, basketball, track, um, ecumenical hunger program, build strong friendships. This is who I needed to be and I encourage you today as parents to let your child be who they need to be. As holistic as it is, and it's not all gonna be perfect. So, this person might get a five on AP Biology. I know I didn't. Um, a calculus B, uh, BC. I did. I think I took it. And if Bonnie can correct me, my teacher at the time came and said to everyone at the beginning of the class, "This is so exciting! Oh my gosh, Pam Holly got her first B on this calculus test." <laughs> so it wasn't my calling, but I stuck with it. So um, you might be doing all these things as a 4.0. And that's all great too. And is this a real person? Yes, it's real too. But it's just different. So you are allowed to be real at Castilea. Now, here is one of my favorites. I said to the team, now this is funny, because my first one who does my slides, I say, just surprise me. And I'm surprised by this one. I said, do something where Castilea is a foundation and you're propelling me up. Well, she did that. She definitely <laughs> did it. Uh, Castilea, there I am. And I'm, uh, wow, all right. I guess I'm being buoyed up by Castilea. So the <laughs> point is, is that Castilea was at foundation and I'm definitely flying in my life now. Um, challenges. Castilea taught me to not give up. This will be absolutely critical in life. My life has been filled with so many blessings, family and loving parents, but I also experienced tremendous challenges in my life. This is my story. I share it with you because your child's going to have a story. It's important that they don't walk by it. I grew up in an idyllic childhood. Here I am with my Oma. There's me. There's my sister who also went to Castilea. Here I am on the beach with my buck teeth. I have to tell you a funny story. My mom took me to the orthodontist, and I was there. And I don't know why adults speak sometimes when the kid is there, like they can't hear. And he remember, remember him saying to her, Miss Holly, we'll see what we can do. And I'm like, what does he mean he's going to say what he's going to do? What do you mean? What do you mean? At that point, we were fitting a deck of 52 cars between my teeth because they were so buck teeth, and I could not close my mouth. So we were dealing with a serious situation, admittedly. So there I am with the buck teeth and my beautiful sister. And there I am, again, a little creativity. We see that. I was an innovator. I had my neck gear first, very much of an innovator. <laughs> now we hit a pivotal moment. We're on a family vacation in Mexico, age 12 here. And I went from a cruise ship on a vacation to a cul-de-sac. My dad and I walked and veered down and saw a cul-de-sac of all these begging, starving children. At the age of 12, that changed my life. And if there's something you remember from today, everyone has a story. And you can walk by your story and go, I don't, I don't want to see it. Or you can embrace it and make it the pivotal background for basically everything I've done in my life. It comes from here. Don't walk by your story. Don't let your child walk by your story. It was unacceptable to me. That word came across my head and I started volunteering in East Palo Alto as soon as I could. It was not okay. This was not what I grew up with. I grew up with love, so should other people have it. I grew up with um, dinners. I grew up with a committed family. How could this not exist in the world? So from there, I went to Guatemala. And when I was in Guatemala, and these are going to be some tough stories I'm sharing with you right now, I was going there to delice kids and help them have showers. They hadn't had showers in months. And walking there on the way, I saw all these people on the ground with, with handkerchiefs on their, on their face. What was going on? They were so depressed that they were taking glue from the shoe factory and passing out because they didn't want to be alive. India. This doesn't happen everywhere, but this is a very hard story. We were in a remote village. They'd never seen white people. There were very, very, very few girls there. It's because it was not acceptable to have them. So in this remote village, they took care of them on the stove. Cambodia, beautiful stupa, beautiful green lawn, everything. I was there serving the victims of Pol Pot's regime, helping them train on computers because they had gotten a lot of their limbs blown off from mines and things of that nature. And I'm looking at this, and I think this is such a beautiful relic. It's amazing. And look at all the green grass around. They said, yes, that is because it is made up of all the people that were killed during Pol Pot's regime. That is what's buried underneath. So in our lives, we're going to be facing all of this beauty, but that is backed up by a lot of sobering stories. And this is what informed my life story in universal giving. So that led to a life of service. At first, one-on-one, -on -one, listening and helping others. This is in El Salvador. Um, and then all over the world and helping people. I could have walked by 
the cul-de-sac. I could have walked by. Or you can let it inform your life. So your life revolves around that story. And so here we have Universal Giving's mission to connect people to quality, vetted giving and volunteer opportunities all over the world. You can come construct a health clinic, you can give a ball or change a life. We do crisis giving where you can go and do a Nepal earthquake recovery. We do give a gift where you can give a donation as a gift. This is one of our favorites. This is what people love the most on our site. It's, it's an orphan chimpanzee. I never would have thought that started Universal Giving. Fund a project where you contribute towards a larger project, such as build a house in Haiti for $1,000, or to help Syrians on the run from war. You give a gift certificate to someone, and that gives the choice in giving. It can be for a birthday, or for a student organization, or a welcome gift, or a recognizing hard work. And then we volunteer. And these are all vetted opportunities all over the world where you can help elephants in Thailand or do more serious relief as well. And then finally, you come back from volunteering and you raise for a cause. So you list all your highlighted favorite projects and you come back, they can volunteer, such as Glenn's favorite causes or Alexandra's birthday wish. Now, this is, I have to tell you this, I made dinner for my mom's birthday. She's a musician. Look, I made that piano cake. That's what you do, right? You raise for a cause. You can do it online or you can raise for a cause, which is my mom, which was to provide a nice piano cake for her. Now, it didn't really turn out like the photos, but just for a little bit of levity here, which I'm not sure went over so well with my family, we always take the dog for a walk, and the leash doesn't always go back up on the ring in the kitchen, and sometimes it's on the bench. So they're like, well, what's the white thing? I'm like, that's Daisy's leash. All right, you got to get specific here. <laughs> uh, so this was my birthday wish. So I can have people, when they come here for my birthday, help expand a small business or health care for war-torn Congo, and people can give. So our unique model is that we give 100%, no cut on the donation. All the organizations are vetted. There's two services. We're in 100 countries, and we generate revenue. So our milestones are such with the Jefferson Award, Homepage, White House, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. And so this pivotal moment that I was just listening revolves around to this, to the go-to site in giving and volunteering all over the world. And this is what we want our vision to be, to create a world where giving and volunteering are a natural part of everyday life. To us, we look at it, it should be just as natural as eating Chipotle. We know that's popular around here. So if it's that popular for you to eat at Chipotle, it's that important for you to give to the world. So how we make money, we have Universal Giving Corporate, we manage CSR programs for companies all over the world. And we have clients such as Cisco and BHP, Sabre, RSF, Gap, Floor, Symantec. And what we do is we create the global strategy, we do NGO vetting, we offer vetting solutions, we refine our systems for them, have excellence in client service, and then we do all of this in vetting. Now, who would have ever thought all of these things in vetting? Information collecting, assessment of NGO, assessment of rating systems, tax status, all that from that trip in Mexico in my time at Castellet encouraging me to do what I could be. But it wasn't easy. And this is where Castileo really came in. Here's where we come into the challenges and why Castileo meant so much to me. So when I was trying to find out what I wanted to do, there was no pathway in social entrepreneurship. There was nowhere to go. There was no nomenclature like that. I went into job after job, and I left four jobs in four years, and it was so painful. I was out of work for a year. I worked as an executive assistant unpaid because he said I didn't deserve to be paid. <laughs> I worked as a step aerobics instructor. I counseled recovering alcoholics on Skid Row. I was a Duke graduate. Friends were on track to be lawyers, doctors, or had MBAs. And I was just super low, super low. So I got, then I got fired as a waitress in Venice Beach because my hand shook. And then I started a business that didn't get off the ground. I was turned down by a PR firm because I wasn't qualified. And then there was the introduction of the web. And with that, I fell in love. <laughs> I thought, oh, I can scale. Oh, I can take volunteering and I can take it all over the world. So volunteer match startup mode, we were the big bad Silicon Valley, the internet world. Who are these hotshot Silicon Valley guys? They were out to make a profit. We were hurting libraries and volunteer centers. And then the biggest question, will the internet last? <laughs> then universal giving startup mode, 
We should be giving locally. It's about our backyard. You're not listening. You should be a for-profit. That's the new thing, and you're behind the times. I want to give you the grant, but my program director seems to be jealous of you, and I can't override her decision. <laughs> you're crazy to launch this after 9-11. That could be true. Um, we don't need this. This is too big of a goal. International giving is not going to play an important part in the role of the world, so you're going to launch the world, and my favorite, is there a market for it? <laughs> that is 2001. What do you do when you have all these notes? It's funny now. But back then, imagine, you're like, boom, boom, boom. Just no, no, no. You're like, wait, I'm try aren't, I, aren't I trying to help the world here? Wow. So all these ups and downs. That's what my life felt like. I was so fortunate to have my family and Castilea. So the challenge is starting universal giving then, once you do it, you work out of your home for two years without pay. I lost my business plan. I couldn't recover it. 80,000 of savings to launch. Built a team of 90% pro bono volunteers. Timing of 9-11. Fought a lawsuit regarding our name. Affected National Foundation funding was a distraction. This is what it felt like. But I remembered my time at Castilea. I cannot tell you how pivotal it was. It's one thing to be loved by your family, and I am so blessed that way. I have two parents who are best friends as a spark, and they're two of my best friends. I'm so grateful to them for the family they created and create this day. But it's another thing to be believed by another institution in a community that is outside of your family. You need that third-party endorsement. And that's what I had at Castilea. I receive constant, authentic encouragement. Not just, you're so great, authentic. Because we did get feedback, like all my univies. I don't know if they still call it here, but we call them univies, uniform violations. They gave me a lot of authentic feedback on that, <laughs> especially when I wore black t-shirts. I did. I had to be a little creative. Although now, in the professional world, I do think sometimes, I'm like, I wore this yesterday. Did anyone see me in that? No, I'm going to wear it again. <laughs> When I hit, where does that come from? Castilea, the uniform. I mean, it made you not have to think about it. It was a good thing. <laughs> when I hit tough times, I knew to believe. When I hit tough times, I knew to believe. Now, we have done $24 million worth of volunteer hours, matched 17,000 volunteers with NGOs, spoke, spoken all over the world, and joined a TV show as an expert. We are all helped by others. And this is me. My mom helped pick out this dress. My friend Lauren helped me pick out these boots. My sister helped me pick out this jacket. My nephews tell me that they think this dress looks cool. That's important to me. <laughs> but we're all put together by people in our lives, not just with our dress, but with who we are. So what Castilea taught me, Pamela's new five Cs, commitment, calling, challenges, crazy kaleidoscope, and Camly. So now we'll get to the last two. Now that you've made it through the hard parts, now I'm going to give you some fun. So, okay. Bonnie, who is my Sevy friend, can vouch for this. At Castle I knew my life had to be dedicated, but always not so serious. And I think this is important for you all as parents. The following photos may shock you. <laughs> I had to put this in. We don't have this in any other presentation. It's tailor-made for you. <laughs> so yes. This was me, and what I did is I actually remember this, Bonnie. I, I had to do this to break free from Castellet being so rigorous. I would drive around the circle with my head wrapped in toilet paper. I'm not kidding. <laughs> no one knew who I was. Mr. Dirks at the time was a history teacher. He'd run around trying to find me. He never found me. It was so great. <laughs> Folk got little eyes, and it was just kind of fun. No one knew who the toilet paper head was. It was me. <laughs> The other thing I did is I went out on the ledge, mom, you don't know this, and on the ledge, it was not safe, I'm sorry, and on the ledge, and one of the teachers who remained nameless, what we did is we kept putting out this little, like, you know those rubber chickens, we go, back. we do a little chicken when she was teaching there, and then we pull the chicken away. <laughs> Anyways, my point is, why do I show you this? Let your children have levity here. There's enough rigor here. Let them have a little bit of that freedom to be a little bit crazy that way. This is the place they can do it. I don't know if I would have had courage to do this at a co-ed school. Probably not. Castellet gave me the freedom to make myself. I had no limitation in this dynamic and inspiring community. I was given the reign to develop all aspects of myself beyond what I could have imagined. I got into improv. Yes, that's me as a Hooters girl in improv. <laughs> that's me. That's my blonde wig. We're moving on. Here we go. Um, 
doesn't go to anyone else. It's definitely not going to the White House. This is a presentation just for you. My team is like, you want that? I want that up there. We're going for it today. All right. And then finally, Camley. Now, I almost lost Castileo. Do we know what the school is? We're not going to mention it. <laughs> We're just not going to mention it. So I went on there and interviewed there, and it did not feel like home. I did not feel like I could be myself. I did not feel like I could speak my voice. And all my friends are going there. I lost a lot of friends. But this is what felt like home. At the end of the day, I didn't feel like I could be myself. I didn't feel like I could speak my voice. And I didn't feel safe. Safe. Safe to be myself. Safe to be dynamic. Safe to really do different things. Castle Life felt like an extension of home. My best, uh, well, my best high school friend, we were Seve's, that's Rachel. We were number one and two tennis players. We love our families. She lost both her parents within a year of each other. Aunt Pammy plays a prominent role in her daughter Nicolin's life. This is the kind of thing that Castilea does for you. Someone that you stay in touch with since you're 12. We have an annual tea party. We go to the zoo. We went to the Disney Ice Follies. Do you know that they charge like $12 for those cups? I'm like, why are these, cheap, these tickets so cheap? And I'm like, how can you say no to your little adopted niece when the snow cone costs $3, but you can't buy it without the cup, so it costs $15? <laughs> Disney's smart. Look at her. She's so sweet. And she plays an important role in me as I aspire to family. I'm not giving up on that. At Castilea, I was loved, cared for, and encouraged, which taught me to do the same for others. And one of the best things to do as a parent, I would imagine, I haven't been one yet, but I've been an aunt for three nephews and nieces. And as I've watched and learned from taking care of my sister's kids, listen, encourage, but don't push. Expect the best, but trust. Don't be caught off guard by surprises and new pathways. <laughs> Try not to push your child into what you hope they would be. Allow them to find their calling. Most important, encourage them to be themselves. But remember, gratitude. How can I be grateful if my child isn't listening to me, my child received a C on a math exam, my child isn't putting enough effort into her studies, my child is too busy with her friends, my child is running up the phone bill, my child likes to have her alone time and isn't social enough, my child doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> be grateful if you have the ability to send your daughter to Castilea the opportunity for your child to get an education, the sun that you woke up, the ability to have dinner with loved ones, that life is so beautiful, the power of faith to impact your life. Most challenges you might face with your child is a luxury trouble compared to what goes on across the world. It's just a luxury trouble, right? I hear so many luxury troubles. My cell phone won't work. My husband parked the car behind my car. I can't get the kids out. Oh my gosh, I forgot the snacks for the kids. Maybe I can find a Cheeto at the bottom of my bag. I know, it happens. <laughs> but it's still a luxury trouble, right? When you look back at El Salvador and Guatemala and what I showed you earlier, if the second point I hope you walk away from today is that it's luxury troubles, you'll get through it. I'm going to share with you someone special. This is my Oma. She is someone very important to me. She was 97 years old when she stopped teaching at Stanford. She was the first woman at Juilliard and a flutist and a world-renowned flutist. And one of the things that my Oma always taught me was when I went over to her home, was she would say, are you ready? And my mom would drop me off there on Saturdays. I'd say, I'm ready. And she'd say, okay, let's go and we would scrub the kitchen floors by hand. <laughs> and I was like, this is fun. This is great. We'd organize our Tupperwares, organize our freezer. I didn't know anything different. But it was the time together. I will never forget that and how proud we felt about that floor. Now, my sister was smarter. She was watching TV in the other room. I didn't, re I didn't really get that was an option. Both are good. Um, I'm a little bit dumb sometimes. I'm like, what's she doing? OK, no, I'll do the floor. OK. Um, most challenges you might face with your child are luxury trouble. So what does the future of your child look like after Castilea? Castilea is already surrounded with more excellence and love than they'll see in their entire lives. You don't need to worry. 
focus on qualities. It's not just about the grades. It's not about perfection. It's not about college. It's not about your child doing their best and being their best. Allow them to become their fully realized self. It's about qualities. That's what you want to cultivate. In the years to come, I would remember a place where I was loved. No matter what the world was telling me, I was taught to believe here. No matter what it told me, I knew I was loved here. I cannot tell you how many times I thought back at Castellay when I had received so many no's and I was so tired launching Universal Giving that I just was like, no, I remember. As much as we would laugh about it too, Bonnie, remember growing wild on the hillside, we would laugh about the song. But I remembered that. And it helped me see that not just my parents believed in me, but that an institution believed in me. And that is not something that helped me then, it helps me now. Believe. And that meant the world to me, in case you couldn't tell. It allowed me to find my calling, to find my story. It allowed me to launch Universal Giving. So, Castilea, thank you. Thank you for just everything you've given me and allowed me to be the person I've been. I, I told my intern, I'm like, dude, make it a lot of thank yous. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. Okay. <laughs> and as much as I want to thank Castilea, I have to give my full heart and gratitude to my parents, who are my greatest models and inspiration. Thank you, Mom and Dad. <laughs> so, another slide. Thank you, Mom and Dad. <laughs> so, Castilea, thank you. <laughs> believe, and I look forward to seeing your child succeed at Castilea, but more importantly, in life. Thank you for having me. one I use, Ken. Put this one back, I guess. Thank you. Does anyone have a Kleenex? Wow. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that was really uh, a testament to Castilea and the impact that it's had on, on your life. And I can only hope, I have to believe that every Castilea girl uh, would would come back as a woman with that that amount of uh, passion and commitment about what the Castellet experience um, did for her. So I'm going to ask one or two questions, and then we're going to turn it over to the group and really uh, allow them to ask you a few questions. How much time do we have? Fifteen minutes. Okay, perfect. So. As I was listening to you and I was imagining uh, being a parent in this room and trying to pull all of that together, uh, the importance of, of believing in yourself, the importance of giving your child space to be who she wants to be, but also this idea of not giving up. And I wondered, aren't there times where it's a good idea to give up? Mm. Yes. And, and if you could talk about that a little bit, because I think that's where we struggle sometimes with our own daughters, is that we're trying to say, do your best, and we're trying to say, be yourself, and then we're saying, don't give up, and sometimes those are in conflict. Mm, mm. So Very much so. Yeah, when, when's it, when is it actually a good idea to move on? Yes. 
I think that's an incredibly important question, and thank you for asking that, because there definitely are times when I have decided to abort certain things, and it was a good idea. Um, I, I think what you have to do is you need to look at the qualities and the motivations as to why you're involved in something. So for example, there were some times with certain volunteer service opportunities that I stopped because my heart wasn't really in it. And then I think you're not being genuine. Um, people can feel from your heart if you're really there to serve or not. Now let's look at qualities again. If you made a commitment and you said, I'm going to be doing this through my program at Castilea and you made a commitment, then you've got to balance that, right? There, there's got to be a balance there and a dialogue with a lot of people that you love and care about to find out what the right thing is. I don't ever take it lightly when you don't finish a commitment. However, um, let's say it was something lighter where I, this happened to me a lot. I tried out a lot of different volunteer opportunities. I did Pets in Need and I loved the idea of caring for dogs, but then I was in four hours alone, like petting, literally, pets in need. And, and, and I just, I was kind of, I'm missing some human interaction, so I stopped it. And so I didn't, that wasn't, the motive was good, but I, I did stop it. There was also a point when we talked about the four years, four jobs, where I was going to start a gift basket business, and I was going to go and sell it into all the companies in downtown in LA, and all of a sudden, I woke up and I was like, I can't do this. I had prepared it. I knew what my inventory is. We all this, and I needed a partner. I couldn't find a partner, and my gut instinct told me not to do it. And so I stopped it, and I ended up calling my parents and saying, I'm not going to do it. And they're like, okay, well, what are you going to do? It was devastating. It was really hard. I'd probably taken about 15 personality tests, and <laughs> I looked back on them the other day. <laughs> that's, that's another presentation. Um, but, uh, you know, that I stopped it. Now, I think you have to develop what I call an SGI, your spiritual gut instinct. And so there's something within you, whether you believe in God or not, there's something within you that is that still small voice that tells you when something is the right thing to do or not. But try to follow what is your calling. Try to follow that, because that's the m most times when you want to follow it. The other thing in looking at qualities, I've run marathons without training. And the, the way I'm able to do that is to focus on qualities and say, if I ran this last step, I will run the next step. That was not acceptable for me to give up. If I ran the last step, why could I not run the next step? And then I told myself that again and again and again and again. And so there are times when qualities-wise, you do not want to give up. When you made the decision that you were not going to be a 4.0 student, mm. what did you give up on? What, what, what mm. didn't you do? In other words, as, as, a, as parents, and we think about... Um, you know, looking at our daughters, trying to balance everything. And uh, there's even more pressure on grades now, probably. Um, you know, you have to have a 4.0 if you want to go to Duke, likely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that, that's probably unfair for me to say, but um, because there's so many more numbers of, yes. of students vying for some of these colleges. Mm -hmm. so and so what was the question? Sorry? The question is, what did you decide to do or not do to make it okay mm. not to, to, to allow yourself not to push for that 4-0? Well, I think what it was was it was, I was, it was making me unhappy, and I was getting super stressed, and I was losing my joy. And if there's one thing my family has taught me is keep the joy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think my parents ever said that, but they embodied joy. They were joy, and it really wasn't acceptable to not have joy in a good way because mm -hmm. it was like we were blessed and this was a joyful life. It started to, it, what, what first of all was very hard for me, it was really hard on my self-esteem because I had been, you know, kind of straight A, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth, all that was really hard on my self-esteem at the beginning, really, mm -hmm. really hard. But as I relaxed into it, I realized, oh my gosh, if, even if I get an A minus here or a B plus here, oh, I can go try junior statements, even though I didn't end up doing that, it allowed me to explore. So for me, I was like, I needed to explore. I needed to be a generalist. I don't know if I would have been a good entrepreneur if I had, I might have been more of someone like a scientist or, or rigorous or structured that way, which is great too, but I needed to explore. And if you're going to run a company, you need to be a good generalist. So in other words, some of those hours that you might have spent unhappily studying, yeah. you spent doing other things? Not only hours spent doing other things and other extracurricular, but I think I would have spent an enormous amount of time, mind space in my mind, stressing about, you know, not even the times when I was working. So it would not have allowed me to fully realize myself because mm -hmm. I would have been on myself and I would have, I would have been chastising myself and on myself. The 3.8, I went, that's good enough. I'm doing my best. 
and I want a full life. Okay, great. So how about some questions from uh, the audience? We have some microphones going around, and uh, I'm sure that you have a lot of uh, questions for Pamela. Sounds like it's on. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hello. So, What's your name? I'm Diana Sunshine, and I have an uh, eighth grade daughter here. And, Great. Um, there was an article in the New York Times this week about pushing your kids, not crushing them. And there was this authentic, I think probably Palo Alto mother saying, oh, I'm so proud of my daughter. She picked her second choice school. That's not so hard. It's, it's Vassar. And I feel like a little bit of your saying, I didn't go for the 4.0, I have a 3.81. It's mm. like, I mean, people can kill themselves for a 3.81. Sure. You know, it doesn't really feel like you're coming down it that easy. much. Yeah, like, oh my God, I'm doing everything. And I'm an honors student, basically. I mean, a lot of um, schools would consider a 3.8 an honors student. So, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's still too close to too high yeah <laughs> i mean it's too high yeah it's like i don't feel like I, you gave up much and so I, i'm not trying to be rude i just not at I'm, all. i feel like it like where's the reality sure. around that and thank you for that and i appreciate that and all i can do is share my story that for me from my perspective the 3.81 was a step down for me that was hard for i know but but i want to clarify something because you brought up something that i think relates to your point diana and I, is it diana or diane Diana, um, because I thank you for that, that question. It's good to have, you know, candid, you know, open discussion about these issues. You know, I literally, if I'm so blessed to have kids, I want them to be happy and to go to a school. It could be Occidental. It could be Santa Clara. You know, I chose Duke over Stanford. The reason why, and I'll tell you, when I was, when I was here in 87, that was not a popular choice. That was not. Bonnie and I were one of four people that got into Stanford, and we were part of this club, and we were all going to go, and I was the one out of the four that didn't go, and it was really, really hard. Remember that, Bonnie? Remember? Yeah, <laughs> like I do. Um, but, but the point was is that Duke was not considered on the same level as Stanford. Maybe now it is in some levels. I think it is much more, but it was not. And I even I got some pretty tough feedback even at Castilea about that decision, but I went because when I went to Stanford, I love it. It's like home to me. But people were super, super hardworking. But they weren't as joyful as they were at Duke. And I chose Duke because of the community and the sense of work hard, play hard. And it was the sense of warmth. And I was like, it just was this gut instinct. I was going to go to Stanford. I went to the mailbox. I put the yes in at Stanford. And all of a sudden, I ran back in the house. And I went, I'm going to Duke. That's how the decision happened, STI. So Duke and Stanford might not be, now it might seem more than, but back then it wasn't. If I'm so blessed to have kids, if they want to go to where it makes them feel comfortable, where they can thrive. You know, my nephew just picked a wonderful school. He's going to it, and we're so thrilled about it. Is it in the top 10, top 20? Probably not. Is it in the top one for him? You bet your lifesavers. It's the best school for him, and we're all thrilled. <laughs> And it is not one of, it is probably a school I didn't know about when I was here at Castilea. So I hope that makes it a little bit more real. The 3.81 was real for me. It was painful for me. Um, but I understand your point, and hopefully that gives you some answers too. I'm just wondering if you can comment on the interns you have and where they're coming from and maybe what you admire about them or any thoughts you would share with us. What a great question. And what's your name? Jennifer. Jennifer. So Jennifer is asking about the interns and what it's like working with the young people. And so we have about 60 people at Universal Giving. There's probably about two thirds of them are interns. And so we get in a flux all the time. The number one thing, and I think this is true about interns, Jennifer, or anyone, no generalizations. I have a 25-year-old intern who can't stand social media. Okay, so, so we sit there and go, oh, they're all online all the time. Not necessarily. This woman's a writer, self-published writer. I mean, everyone's, everyone's different, right? I think the, the thing to watch for and the things that are positive, the things for watch for is the sense that they're super, super proactive about wanting experience really, really early and not always wanting to, like, not pay their dues, but just do other work sometimes. And so sometimes you just have to say, you know, this They don't is know about scrubbing the floor. <laughs> 
bring him to my Oma's house, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and so I think, I think that's just something to watch. Um, but, but what I love is they are absolutely joyful. They are about committed. Now, I mean, when I grew up, the nomenclature around was when I'm 50 and I make it big, then I'll give back. I, I'm actually in pain for the interns because they are literally so hard on themselves about I have to do something that's meaningful now. Now, they're postponing making money or maybe not even thinking about making money. A lot of them are living with their families, all of that. So I think that there's something so admirable about that. They just really, and, but sometimes too much pressure. Because part of me says, look, if you want to be an accountant, if you, I mean, I need somewhere to bank the funds for universal giving. Like, please, like, create a bank. Don't go do, become another social entrepreneur. Where am I going to put my money, right? Like, it's, you know, if you want to be a gardener and you love, like, curating lawns, great. I'm about people finding a calling, not about it has to be labeled good. It's all good. So I think I really admire that with them. I think that they do need structure. They do need management. Um, and they're very much about working in teams. So we have an open office. My office is with them, too. And so all business units get to sit together. I think they like and crave that sense of community. They want to be around each other. I don't see as many introverts with the young interns today. But that's just me. Back there, Polly. I see a couple questions. I'm Stacy. Yes. My daughter's broke in seventh grade. And I just I wondered if you've had a chance to talk to the kids at the school because um, I particularly enjoyed the, the story aspect of your talk and the nonlinear path. Um, I think so many kids sort of look and expect the linear path, and like you were even just saying with interns, the quick success. And I've worked mostly in nonprofit type of stuff too, and I've seen all kinds of amazing nonlinear paths, but I'm not sure the yeah. kids, you know, get that message very much. And so I think it would be really powerful. I, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to talk to the students, but I'd love to hear them get that message. Wonderful. And I'm happy to do it, whether it's formally or, you know, um, I'll, I'll give you my style. It's 415-846-8783. I'm totally not kidding. I tell people to call me all the time. I'm like, I'll be washing the dishes. Someone's calling me up. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, no problem. I literally, I, I'm not kidding. We, we have a slide where we put my cell phone up there and just say, if someone needs to talk, about a pathway, because everyone's pathway is unique, just give me a call. And if it's not convenient, I'll call you back at another time. But the point is that accessibility. And Stacy, if I can help your daughter or any students here or present here, I've also got a um, writing. I do a lot of writing for Fast Company and other institutions. It's called Rough, The Journey of a Social Entrepreneur. And it goes into how hard it was for us to find social entrepreneurship because it didn't exist. So you know, if there's any way I can help, um, here's the easy way to remember my number. It's 846-TRUE, okay? 415-846-TRUE. So um, I'm very happy to talk to anyone or, or help anyone. Over the years, you have spoken at some of our Global Weeks, but yes. it's not recently, yes. I think. That, yeah. So it would be great to have you back. Right behind you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, and um, my daughter is heavy into the arts. So I was curious how the arts has formed your life. What what type of impact and how it brought you to your your challenges? Great. And is your name Elizabeth? I'm Elizabeth. You're Elizabeth. Thank you. So Elizabeth, this is very interesting. So first of all, I come from a very musical family. My grandmother, you know, first one at Juilliard. My mom's a professional flutist. Um, I actually debuted in flute at Stanford. Um, I was. Uh, Oh, how should we say it? I, was, I, was, I think I was like a B player, so I eventually that is something I ended up giving up, was the flute when I was 16. I played it with my grandmother. It meant a lot to me, but it wasn't in my heart. So that was a very difficult decision of something of like, okay, something I have to give up because I've tried it. I've done it for 10 years, but it doesn't feel right anymore, right? So what happened, with, interesting enough, Elizabeth, is I went into acting here, and I had a, a role as a frog. And I, um, I did that in eighth grade, and I had one line, and the line was, the king is ready. And I practiced that again and again and again. And then I practiced it again, and I practiced it again. And when it came time to say it on stage, I froze and I forgot it. And that was the end of my acting career at Castilea. <laughs> And I, it literally scarred me. Not Castilea, me scarred me. I was like, I can't do this. Well, what's interesting about it is that Castilea never lets you let it go, right? So I was on a date when I was 30, and I, he took me to an improv show. I'd never seen it before. So I was like, what is this? And I was like, oh my gosh, they're like giving a suggestion, and if they do it from nothing, 
and then create a scene from nothing. I wonder if I can do that. And I was like, you can't wonder if you're doing it. You're in startup mode with universal giving. You can't wonder anything. There can be no no's in your mind. You're entrepreneurial, you're starting. So I went into startup mode with universal giving and then I did um, improv. And for the first three years, I was awful. I froze on stage. I'd go home laughing, crying, crying, going, why am I doing this? And at one point I broke. Well, Castellea informed that because I knew not to give up. I knew there was something I loved about it. And so at Castellea, while I was first a failure, it was important to me because I also knew Castellea does not let you fail. So I might not have manifested the arts here, but even if, let's say for me, I didn't do necessarily well in the arts here, it can come back later in your life. And I remembered that stick to from Castellea and it allowed me to succeed with improv later. So sometimes the arts can inform your life later, but still have a basis in what's happening at Castellea. So that is a good point. There are some things in life here where your child might not succeed in it, but it comes back later. Do improv? I never, I, I, it wasn't available. You know, I, I, it just didn't even, it, I, I didn't even occur to me. So I mean, that's another thing that Castellea teaches you is it's not just like a, a learning field here. You're constantly learning in life, right? So I'll go stick my hand in the candy jar again and go like, like the next thing I want to do is I want to learn and get certificates in peace and conflict resolution, right? So Castle is always teaching you to learn and get. How are we doing on time? I think we may need to um, have one more question, do you think? Last one. One last. Last, one. last question. Hi, I'm Suzanne. I was just wondering if you could talk about how being at an all-girls school in middle school and high school shaped your experience and how you um, found that it created any kind of foundation or meaning for you later in your life. Mm, thank you, Suzanne. I have to say it was really, it fit for me. And if I'm so blessed to have kids, again, I'm, I'm going to really listen to what's right for my kids because I don't think it's right for everyone. I wish it were because I found it to be such a blessing, but everyone's different. For me, it allowed an incredible sense of focus. I got to see my guy friends on the side, but I needed that focus to be here. And when I went and visited a lot of the other schools, this is just me, but I felt intimidated in the sense that I felt I really couldn't. There was a lot of jostling, a lot of really fun, quippy jokes. I was there to learn. I was pretty straight and narrow. I was like, I wanted to excel. That was, that was partly Castellea, partly my parents, but partly just who I was. I, I wanted, I wanted to, you told me to do this, I wanted to do it and I wanted to do it right. And, and so it was the environment that really worked well for me there to focus and to not get labeled as a geek. If anything, I mean, I wouldn't be labeled a failure, but I had so many models ahead of me getting four or 4.2s that for me, I was so happy to be around those models of excellence. So Castellet was excellence, not perfection, but excellence, as my dad always taught me. My dad was like, we're not about perfection in our family, we're about excellence doing our creative best. And so Castellet really taught me that it allowed me the safety to be who I am. Now, at some point, you've got to be able to mix with different, you know, populations. And so if your child does go here, it is important to have some type of outlet, I believe. I was a tennis player. So I got to go to tennis camp. I met a bunch of guy friends there. I went to the other name schools, you know, some of their sporting events, things like that. Um, and, and to try and have some other types of outlets that way. But it was safe for me. It allowed me focus. And um, I, just, I just felt peaceful here. Sometimes you can't explain things, Suzanne. Sometimes it's just about that SGI of like, it just felt right, and it just felt like home. And um, even when I was considering other schools, I just walk away from it, and I was really torn by it, but I was theoretically torn. I was never torn in my heart. I can't explain it. I'm sorry, I didn't answer that very well, but it's too hard to explain. No, you did, you did wonderfully. And I'd like to um, close with repeating something that you said that was um, good for me to be reminded of, and I think all of us, and that is excellence is not perfection. Mm -hmm. And we talk about excellence at Castellea all the time, and I do believe that the girls internalize that as perfection, mm -hmm. and we all need to collectively um, own the responsibility of reminding them that there's a difference. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your excellent presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So I know we have lots of young ladies that will be soon uh, waiting for us outside at lunch. See you out there. Stay cool.